Hello, you're watching Telecom TV. I'm Martin Warwick and this is Executive Insight. And today I'm talking with Naguib Sawiris, who is the CEO, the chairman and the founder of the Arascom Group. Mr. Sawiris, welcome. I'd like to begin by asking you about Mobineal, your mobile venture here in Egypt, where we are now in Cairo. Tell us what's going on there, what's happening. Well, uh, uh, our aim for the future is to remain the dominant operator in Egypt, which we still are, after, uh, even after the third entrant uh, came in and, and the competition became uh, as fierce as it is now. We are uh, 16 million subscribers, around 16 million subscribers. We, are, uh, we intend to grow uh, very much this year too. We have been performing very well on our financials, but mostly at the recognition and, and the, our client base is uh, quite a happy base, you know. So, of course, we have our downsides and upsides, you know. Moving away from Mobineal for a moment, tell us about the greater Egyptian market, the mobile telephony market. How vital is it? Where's it going? Oh, it has a big potential. I, I personally believe that we will see penetrations everywhere in the world of 100%. It depends when we achieve that. So, if you if you talk about uh, in Africa, for example, uh, Chad, you know, okay, it will take you another 100 years to get to 100%. But if you talk about Egypt, then I guess in four or five years, we'll see a penetration which could get to the 100% level, taking also the consideration that many people have more than one line, you know, so. And what's Oraskam's strategy for further developing the group and the company? The market is, is growing very fast here. So our, our aspiration is to grab most of that growth so we have a very aggressive plan to grow our network, to push on the capacity. Uh, we, uh, we are, we are uh, concentrating on, 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 on the traditional voice and SMS and business. So we, we were not big fans of 3G. I know the minister will not like the statement, but uh, it's, a, it's a fact. So uh, we, we, we got a little bit delayed with the 3G issue for various reasons, you know. Uh, but we, our, our main intention now is to focus on grabbing most of that uh, growth, you know. So penetration right now is around 50% or something. There's still a big room to go and we intend to be uh, grabbing most of that. You mentioned 3G just now and you said you're not a fan of it. Why is that? Is it because it's not relevant to your subscribers or for another reason? No, the, uh, it's not relevant to our, our, uh, our subscriber base, you know. So uh, also in the West, I mean, it, it's very nice to talk about 3G, but there are some numbers, for example, is uh, let's take uh, a, a Vodafone or an Orange, you know, uh, maximum 10% of their subscriber base after five or six years of launching 3G is 3G, you know. So uh, it's more of a buzz than, uh, you know, today with, uh, with Edge, uh, you get speeds which are quite comfortable for your email, for your broadband and so on. Uh, if you have a uh, an ADSL line at home, you know, you can have a faster speed for your internet. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to use your laptop while you're driving, you know. So uh, there is a lot of issues with that, you know. I'm not uh, a big fan of that, you know. What are the main market opportunities? The main market opportunity is the organic growth here in Egypt, you know. And then we can talk about new applications which became popular like music or uh, SMS, you know. But for us, there is a new application which we are a very big fan of, and it's really tailored for Africa, and that is mobile banking. So 2008, we'll see a, a, a very big move from Orascom Telecom as a group, and most of its market in that direction, you know. The ITU Telecom Africa show is due to be held here in Cairo in the near future. How important is an event like that to Egypt, to the telecom community here, and in Greater Africa? Well, you know, I mean, we are in, in Algeria, we are in Tunisia, we are in Egypt, you know, and these are the, uh, uh, Algeria and Egypt are one of the two largest countries in, in Africa, so the combined uh, population is over 100 million, you know. Recently, uh, we decided to create a new company, which will also start going to other areas in Africa. Uh, this company will be totally uh, staffed and managed independently, so it will not take from the focus of the Eurascom Telecom Group, but it will have the backing of the group. And this new entity will uh, build on our uh, operation in Zimbabwe, we'll go to other areas uh, in Central Africa and so on, and try to caption whatever licenses uh, are available still in Africa. And the reason behind that is we believe that the opportunities now are getting so scarce that even uh, uh, difficult markets or smaller countries in Africa are worthwhile to uh, have a second look at, you know, and as we've now uh, really uh, built the, the mass we have, you know, I mean, we are... Uh, the group will, will cross the 100 million subscriber this year, hopefully, with the, our European assets, of course. 
Uh, we believe that it's, uh, it's good to go back to Africa and uh, there is potential and growth. Uh, penetration is still very low. And I think with the new applications we have of mobile banking, we have a very good solution. Uh, but what we didn't want is to take the focus of the Rascom Telecom Management and put it into the smaller countries in Africa. So now we have a completely new company called uh, Telecom Globe, uh, Telecel Globe, sorry, uh, which is the old name we still own, Telecel, and which will be building on the Zimb Zimbabwe's asset to, uh, to move forward. And maybe we can hope for some change in Zimbabwe too. So. <laughs> <laughs> What about Let's move away from Africa then and look at the rest of the world. What is your strategy there? I know you have licenses in very many other parts of the world. You have some in Europe, but I believe you're concentrating mainly on the Far East. Well, on the Orascom Telecom Group, we are still looking at whatever is rest, but we're focusing on Asia. So we have this North Korean license now. We're building it now. We expect to launch before uh, uh, June. Uh, it's moving very well, and, it, and we, have a, we will be the only mobile operator in North Korea, hopefully for a while at least, you know, we have a four years exclusivity. So that's a, a big operation. We're building a, a lot of hopes on that. We're still looking at other opportunities in Asia. Uh, if they're small, again, they will go into the uh, Telecel globe. If they're big enough, Horascom Telecom Management will be involved. Uh, on the European front, we believe there is going to happen, a consolidation is going to happen. So all the small operators will have to come uh, and, and come together and, and otherwise they will be very weak to face the Telefonicas, the Vodafones or the Oranges. So we believe that with our assets in, in Italy and Greece that we can provide some uh, contribution to that. Very interesting this about North Korea. How on earth did you manage to persuade them to open up the mobile networks to provide GSM in North Korea, a communist state that has traditionally just repressed everybody and kept everything down and not allowed anyone except the inner sanctum to have access to any kind of mobile telephony. First of all, they were prepared for the change. So I cannot really convince someone to convert from a communist to a capitalist. You know, it takes uh, uh, more than what I can believe to do. However, they have decided to open up. They, I, and I guess they, for them the, the, the catalysator was the, the Chinese model. I mean, they look at China, they see this motherhood of communism suddenly converting to capitalism, they see the richness, they see the improvement of the people of China's life, they get jealous and they move. I mean, you can say, well, why didn't they get jealous from South Korea? Because there's a kind of animosity and so on. But the Chinese giant and the, and the change in China has induced, okay. Politically, I believe that they never had the intention to use the nuclear bomb. They're not as crazy as people would like to think they were. They just wanted to make a point. We can do it. Why? We, why? And they did. They made the point, and now they're dismantling. And now, if uh, you can also ask me, how did they could convince the New York Philharmonica to go and play a concert in, in Beijing? So it means they're good people. They're just peaceful as everybody else, and they want a good life like everybody else. We were there at the right time. We have invested in other sectors. So my brother built a cement plant. We are now trying to help him with the mining industry that they have. We are building a real estate and so on. So as a group, we have always moved as a group. It enhances our presence in the country. So we are very optimistic. And, and you say it will be launched before June? I hope, yes. At least the first call, you know. And this is for ordinary northern Korean citizens? That's what our license says. You know, so we, uh, we, we, we believe it's going to be a breakthrough when it happens. I trust these, the North Koreans and that they'll keep their commitments. This is the current commitment, you know. But until I have sold 100,000 handsets, <laughs> I, I want to be cautious. Coming back again to the ITU, how important do you think shows like the ITU shows are, which comes around here sort of once every four years, what effect do they have, a long-lasting one? Okay, I mean, my perception, uh, the I, first of all, the ITU of today is not the ITU of five years ago. Five years ago, it was a group of incumbents, governments, uh, bureaucracies, World Bank, I mean, and really, now in the last four or five years, there has been an improvement. Uh, there has been a dialogue between the ITU and the GSM Association, which I'm a board member and a founder. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, they have uh, attracted many of us to be part of their uh, board. They've built bridges, they've been moving faster, and therefore there is a new breed uh, at, at the management and the helmet of the, of the ITU. So that has been a, a change. Now, the fact that they're coming back to Egypt, you know, I mean, I don't like to boost because I'm Egyptian and say, but Egypt is really a, a central country in the Middle East and in Africa. So 
when you come here, everybody is here. You have all the vendors, all the exhibitors. You've got everybody, and it's a destination people like to come to. And, and it also recognizes Egypt as one of the countries which really liberated its uh, telecom uh, uh, early enough. I mean, we still have some countries which have not privatized uh, their incumbent, which have not offered these licenses, three licenses, which does not have 3G. So Egypt is the, one of the first countries in the Arab world that, you know, launched 3G and so on. So what's the effect within Egypt and on Africa overall as a result of one of these shows? As I said, it brings recognition, but it also brings traffic, it brings uh, movement and it brings uh, inter-networking between the, you know, because again, you know, it's a chance for us to meet all the governments in Africa, see what is their plans on privatization, how can we help the network separation now, fixed line and uh, side, what uh, other, uh, when are they going to issue their 3G licenses, how are they progressing? No, it's, uh, it's very good for us, you know, and, and us being here headquartered too, it's an opportunity, you know. What's your relationship like with the regulator, the NTRA? Uh, they could be better, but it's always like that. It's like, I mean, it's a cat and mouse situation, you know. Uh, but uh, we, we have maintained uh, quite an acceptable level of, uh, sometimes they, uh, they, uh, um, we have disputes, it's like now we have one, for example, so it's not the best moment to ask me. But <laughs> That's the reason <laughs> yeah, I Yeah, because that. they delayed the frequencies for our 3G, uh, you know, and we uh, said, okay, if you delay it, then we delay the launch and we delay the payment, you know, so it's just uh, as per contract, it says that, so. There are this, but uh, on general, we have a very good respect for the regulator. He's done a good job in this market, so it's been quite uh, a success. And we usually get along very well, you know. A final question to you then. In terms of Egypt as a whole, liberalization and privatization have had a marked effect on the market here. Do you think it's gone far enough or does it need to go further? No, there has to be further change. They should. Uh, be more aggressive in privatizing Egypt Telecom more aggressively so the government should uh, dispose some more of its ownership and uh, and even to the extent that they could consider a, a, a strategic uh, uh, player to come in and make an acquisition on the company because as long as the government owns part of the company they still play a protector they play I mean uh, uh, the second license for fixed line now when you read through it you read through the lines the protectionism again so that's I know the minister is not going to be very happy with this, but he's, uh, he was with me in school, so we are colleagues, so <laughs> I hope he will accept my criticism. <laughs> well, I'm interviewing tomorrow afternoon. Okay, so, but, um, yeah, whatever he doesn't like in my interview, you can just cut. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Sawiris, thanks very much indeed.